Okay. So this Financial Source webinar will be led by our presenter, Michael Soon Lee. Michael Soon Lee, CRS, GRI, is a real estate expert and author of eight books, including Secrets of Selling Multicultural Real Estate Clients and Black Belt Negotiating. Dr. Lee has been a real estate broker for over 40 years, selling hundreds of homes to clients throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. In addition, he was a certified financial planner and was enrolled to practice taxation before the Internal Revenue Service. We are in for a real treat. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Brittany. Hi, everyone. It is my honor and my privilege to be here with you today from the San Francisco Bay Area. My thoughts and prayers are with each and every one of you for your safety and good health. Just remember that I have a doctorate degree in business and not medicine. I can't tell you how disappointed my parents were when they found that out. So just remember, whenever I talk about the coronavirus or COVID-19, I'm speaking as a layperson and not as a physician. We're going through some extraordinary times, but rest assured, we will get through this if we work together as professionals. This is not the first crisis our industry has faced and it certainly won't be our last. In my 44 years in real estate, I have seen and survived many challenging times. For example, in 1980, and I'll bet some of you weren't even born then, interest rates across the United States were 18.5% and higher. The reason is it got so high is that the Federal Reserve was trying to reduce inflation, which is currently running at 13.5%. I know that's hard to believe. And yet, even during this time of high interest rates, people still bought and sold homes, but certainly activity slowed down. On October 22nd of 1987, the Dow Jones average fell by 508 points or 26%. And this was the largest percentage drop in one day in the history of the Dow Jones. This became known as Black Monday. The trading of risky derivatives and options caused investor panic and yet home prices continued to appreciate. On November, I'm sorry, on September 11th of 2001, this was a national tragedy, but we all came back stronger than ever because we all pulled together. And when it became clear that this was a localized event on the East Coast, it had little effect on housing throughout the nation. In 2002, hundreds of tech companies failed which caused the NASDAQ 100 to drop 78% from its peak and investors lost millions of dollars. However, this mostly affected Silicon Valley here in California and had almost no impact on housing except here in the local area where thousands of people lost their jobs. In 2004, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates six times in six months. And in 2005, it raised rates eight times. This dramatically increased the payments on interest-only loans, which were prevalent at the time. And as a result, the subprime mortgage industry collapsed in 2008, as we all know. In 2008, 3.1 million homes were foreclosed and nearly 8 million homes uh, eventually went into foreclosure between 2007 and 2016. Home prices decreased by 50% or more in some areas. However, we are not likely to see this severe of a problem as a result of the coronavirus because we don't have the banking dysfunction 
and the over-leveraging that imploded the housing market in 2008. However, we are beginning to see the effects of the virus. People in non-critical businesses are being laid off, and restaurants to clothing stores and much more are being closed, at least temporarily. However, many of these businesses will not recover and go out of business, so unemployment is definitely going to rise. As you can see from this slide, we're already beginning to see the unemployment starting to spike. And again, the coronavirus is beginning to affect our industry from one end to the other. And I'm sure you're already beginning to see this as well. Half of all realtors say that the home buyer interest has decreased due to coronavirus. And probably much more are going to see that in the next couple of weeks or so. And when was the last time you saw Zillow reducing its prices? Well, it just reduced the cost to its premier agents by 50% for one month, and I am expecting that it's going to continue that for a while. And, of course, virtual showings are increasing dramatically. So what's the impact? Well, the current pattern that we're seeing now differs from a standard slowdown. Economic activity generally falls for six to 12 months and then recovers more slowly as opposed to one where it falls quickly and then recovers more quickly. So it appears that the economic activity from this virus is gonna be a bit more slow. NAR expects a temporary softening of the real estate market, which we're seeing already, but it should be followed by a strong rebound in many markets once the economic quarantine is lifted that we're all experiencing right now. And NAR feels this way because there is pent up demand. We've had a housing shortage for many years and there still should be some low interest rates right now. We've got the lowest interest rates in terms of mortgage loans in history and we feel that it's gonna continue. So there should be good demand in many areas after the quarantine is lifted. But what are we feeling right now? Well, buyers are afraid of losing their jobs. I've had a number of clients canceling their transactions because they have lost or are losing their jobs. Other buyers I've got standing in the wings, but they're afraid that prices are gonna drop after the quarantine is lifted. Because again, people are losing their jobs. So I'm finding that those who don't have to buy right now are waiting on the sidelines. And yet I'm trying to get across to them the fact that mortgage rates are the lowest in history and we still have a housing shortage. So it should be a good time to buy after the quarantine is lifted. On the seller side, Right now, they don't want strangers walking through their homes, possibly with a virus and touching all their belongings. Uh, they're afraid they won't get full value for their homes if property prices dip after uh, the quarantine is lifted. So I'm finding that those who don't have to sell right now are waiting. Those who have to sell are gonna take a little bit of a hit in some markets and maybe not at all in your market. It really depends on where you are in the country. So it's up to us as real estate professionals to stay on top of whether our marketing is, market is rising or falling at any particular time, because that's the number one thing that sellers and buyers are going to want to know. Now, if your seller is still occupying the home after the quarantine is lifted, it might be a good time to have them move to a motel because you're going to want to make sure the property looks its absolute best when it hits the market. So you'll want to have it empty if at all possible and then staged so they can store their belongings in a pod. I've had many of my clients do this and it works out very well. They just put it in the pod, a truck comes, picks it up, puts it into a huge storage facility. When they find their next home or wherever they're gonna be moving to, the truck takes their pod, 
brings it to the next place, and they can unload it, or they can hire movers to unload it, and then uh, they make one move rather than two. So this is a good thing to do. Uh, sellers who have to sell uh, might face weeks of uncertainty, so they might start cutting their prices. So in some areas, we're going to see that happening as well. So one of the things that we're going to need is a budget. And especially if you don't have any kind of emergency fund, you need a budget because you need to prepare for a financial emergency like the one we're going through right now. And so the first step you should take is to determine which costs you can pay, and that's by looking at your budget. The budget can help you pinpoint exactly what you can pay right now and which maybe you can defer. It can also help you determine exactly how much help you might need from friends, from relatives, from other Realtors. In my area, we have a Realtor fund that can help Realtors in distress. You might need help from the federal government, from your lender, and from other folks. So this budget can help you determine exactly how much help you're going to need. So NAR has put together some budget forms for you if you don't already have one. This, um, excuse me, <coughs> this is the monthly business expense budget. This helps you run your budget for your business. And so you've got to have one of these because I hope and suspect you expect to be in business after this is all done. So you've got to have a budget. Where are you spending your money? Where can you cut back? And you can find this budget at financialwellness.realtor. Great resources here, and you can find your business budget there. But in addition, same website, financialwellness.realtor, you can find a personal monthly budget. And this is for yourself and your family. This is where you can find a lot more expenses that you can possibly cut or defer. But again, if you don't have your own budget laid out, these are great resources, financialwellness.realtor. So part of your budget should be an emergency account first. Now, what is an emergency account? That's at least six months living expenses already sitting in a separate bank account that you do not touch unless there's emergencies. And unfortunately, 44%, almost half of all U.S. adults can't even pay an unplanned expense of just $400. Many of us are incurring expenses of much more than that. So you can see this is why we need an emergency budget. That's why I put that as number one on your budget. And the other sad fact, is that according to NAR, only 35% of Realtors even have a savings account. We, I know, 44 years in this profession, I've seen people come and I've seen them go. We tend to spend all of our commissions and sometimes more every time we get them. Rarely do we put anything aside in a segregated savings account. In fact, Many of us hardly have any money left to pay our taxes on April 15th. And so very, very important to have an emergency account and a savings account. So if you don't have an emergency fund, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes. And if you do, congratulations, you can relax and Enjoy while I talk to those folks who don't have an emergency fund yet. I'll address your issue in just a minute. But if you don't have three to six months savings right now, you've got to ex reduce expenses immediately. Find a way to cut at least $1,000 a month in personal expenses today. So go download those budget planner worksheets and start planning this right after this webinar. You've got to cut back on anything that is non-critical. Now, some of you may say, these are critical, but guess what? These are what I consider to be non-critical. 
Coffee shops. Many of us can't even go out to coffee shops in the Bay Area. We're restricted just to staying in our homes, except for going out to the bank, to the doctors, or going for groceries. But when this is released, eh, a lot of us are going to think about going back to Starbucks and Keats and other places. So think about possibly cutting back on that. Dining out can be very, very expensive. Cable bills, very, very high. Have a look at that. And if you need to know how to cut that cable bill and you don't know how, find a 12-year-old and they'll show you Hulu, Amazon Prime, and other places where you can cut your cable TV bill. Expensive gym memberships. You're probably walking outside around your block just for exercise right now, you may not need an expensive gym membership or at least find a less expensive gym. Reduce or eliminate credit card interest. We'll talk about that some more. Look for sales and use coupons and then become a savings guru. There is a website called www.americasaves.org and this provides a ton of ways to save money and ideas. Look at this one that's highlighted on the left. 54 ways to save money. If I haven't given you enough by the end of the program, go to americasaves.org and look at some other ways to save money. They've got some wonderful ideas that could apply to you. So I mentioned credit cards. You've got to pay off those credit cards every single month. Make that a goal. If you can reduce your credit card balances by $1,000, you can save $150 to $200 a year in interest, and that's if you have a good rate. If you're paying that penalty rate of 20 to 30%, it's, you can double that amount for every $1,000 that you've got in debt. So please, please, please pay off your credit cards because that is non-deductible on your taxes and a total waste of money. Next, I know this is a little weird, but check to see how much credit balance you have on your credit cards. In other words, how much credit have you not used? This can be used as a very expensive, but a, an emergency fund if you absolutely need it. So you have to look at the red highlighting I've got down there. This shows you out of your 10,000 credit line, what you've used up and you've got $2,000, a little bit over that, as available credit to use in an absolute emergency. So have a look, it only takes a minute, have a look at your credit balance. And again, no one wants to be penalized for late payments on your credit cards. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this on a regular basis, but because of the coronavirus, your creditors may give you a little bit of a break. So if you're having trouble paying your credit cards, even the minimum, contact your creditor or creditors and let them know your situation because of the coronavirus. They may be able to work with you to prevent hurting your credit score. I mean, they are being much more generous right now. So this may be an opportunity to hold off some of those payments if you absolutely must. So again, we talked about prioritizing expenses, but one of the things you're gonna find is in order to cut expenses, you have to change your lifestyle. You have to live a little more frugally. So in order to do that, it's gonna hurt. You're gonna become a little, maybe a little depressed. So in order to survive that, rely on your network, your network of family, of friends, a fellow Realtors to get through this because we're gonna need every one of us to help each other out. So I mentioned the April 15th deadline. Well, as many of you know, that has been extended to July 15th, not only to file your taxes, but to pay your taxes, which surprised the heck out of me. Normally, if you file an extension, they only give you an extension to file your return, not to pay your tax. But in this particular very unique instance, the IRS has waived or extended the deadline for filing and paying your taxes. But I recommend that you prepare your tax return now. Get to your accountant 
buy TurboTax, do your return now. Why do you want to do it now if your taxes are not due? Well, if you owe taxes in July, this gives you four months to save up. So it's not a big shock, and you can put that as part of your budget. In addition, why should you prepare your tax now? If you're entitled to a refund, apply early, and you can add that to your emergency fund when you get that back. So please think about preparing your tax return now. You'll want to know your FICO score. Many of us get it for free, but you've got to know your FICO score and then improve it if you can by paying your bills on time, getting rid of some extra credit cards, because what it does is it helps you to borrow in an emergency at the best rates. So FICO score, very, very important. You can get your FICO score for absolutely free because you're entitled to one free report from each of these companies, Experian, Equifax, and MyFICO every single year. But instead of pulling them all at one time from all three, I recommend that you pull one every four months. So throughout the year, you know exactly where you're standing. Is your score going up? Is it going down? Has someone taken over your identity in the last couple of months? Now, people wonder, if I pull my own FICO score, doesn't that lower my FICO score? And the answer is no. Because when you pull your own FICO score, that is known as a soft pull. So it does not affect your FICO score. When you apply for a car loan or a mortgage, that is known as a hard pull, and that will reduce your FICO score. So just so you know, but do know your FICO score and do know how you're doing with it every four months. And again, absolutely free. Now, if you're working from home, expect a nasty surprise because your home energy bills are going to be higher. You may not have thought about that, but guess what? That's a fact of life. So one of the things you want to do is to kill energy vampires. Now, what are these? This is any device that uses energy even when it's turned off, such as performing updates, connecting to a remote server, and recording data. That is an energy vampire. So you want to get rid of those as much as possible. Some devices, such as uh, a fax copy machine or something of that nature, the on function uses almost as much of a load as the off function. For example, uh, a fax inkjet fax copy machine uses an average of 6.22 watts while it's on and 5.3 watts when it's in standby. So that means that you're doubling or more than that your monthly bill by leaving each remote device standing in the standby or ready mode. So think about killing energy vampires. And here they are in order of wastefulness. Your television set, it's just waiting for you to turn it on and watch Game of Thrones, video game consoles, desktop computers and displays, your laptop, kitchen appliances, there's not always much we can do about those, but certainly satellite and cable boxes when it's not on, cable modems, and your cell phone. Once it's fully charged, unplug it. So how do you spot an energy vampire? It's very simple. If it has an external power supply, it is an energy vampire. If it has a remote control, it's a vampire. If it has a continuous display like a clock, it's a vampire. And if it charges batteries, it's a vampire. So how do you kill an energy vampire? It's not with a silver bullet. You put them on a dedicated switch, a little $10 switch like this. The extra energy cost consumes more than $5.8 billion a year. 
and it sends more than 87 billion pounds of carbon dioxide into the air every single year. So do the environment a favor and do yourself a favor, kill those energy vampires with a dedicated switch. But there is a possibly nice surprise. If you had to work from home, there could be some offsetting savings. So you're not going to have commuting costs like gas and tolls, train, bus, whatever you happen to do. You're not having coffee at Starbucks if you're uh, staying at home like we have to. If you brew your own coffee, it costs 26 cents for an eight ounce cup as opposed to five bucks. Lunch at the deli or restaurant saves you about $5 a day, and you're probably not dry cleaning your business clothes while you're staying at home. I'm talking to you right now in a jogging outfit. I don't have to send that to the dry cleaners. And guess what? No vacation costs. That's a sad fact, but it is certainly a savings. And again, you got to please have an emergency fund, because in my 44 years, what I've learned is that more agents leave our profession not because they don't work hard, not because they aren't successful. Why do they leave? It's because they can't have, well, they don't have an emergency fund, and they can't handle the uneven cash flow of commission sales. You get a big commission or two this month, you spend it all, and then next month or two or three, there's nothing. And then they're off working at Macy's or someplace else. I see them around, but it's sad. So this is another reason why you really need to have an emergency fund as a commissioned salesperson like a realtor. If you don't have an emergency fund and you need it, you might want to consider applying for a home equity line of credit, otherwise known as a HELOC. Unfortunately, it's no longer tax deductible, but the interest rates, rates are way lower than putting it on your credit card. So if you need to, and if you're able to, consider applying for a HELOC before putting things on your credit card. And please, 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 only borrow from your retirement account as a last resort. Some of you have done a great job building up a nice retirement account, and you're looking at $100,000, $500,000 or more, and you're thinking, I could borrow from that. I'll pay it back. No problem, but it'll get me over the hump here of this short-term problem that we're experiencing. But if you do not pay it back, and most people don't statistically, It'll be taxed at your regular income tax rate, which is high, plus a 10% penalty, which means you're going to lose over a third of whatever you pull out and more if you have a state tax like we do in California. So that is extremely expensive money if you're going to do it. So only as a last resort, should you even consider borrowing from your retirement account? And please consult your financial advisor before you consider anything like this. Well, if you need to, you might want to consider a side job to augment your income if you've been in the business for a while. A lot of newer agents might appreciate you being their coach. You might consider becoming a notary. They get $75 to $200 per appointment. It does take some time, and you've got to be licensed. If you have a good eye, you could be a home stager. Now, I have a terrible eye, so I hire a stager for every listing I've got. You can do transaction management for other realtors in your spare time. You know this business. You know your local forms. You could do that. If you're good at marketing, you can do digital marketing for some newer agents. In a lot of areas, property values are going to go down for a while. So you could help your clients do tax assessment appeals so they could lower their tax rate until the property values come back. 
you could be a real estate appraiser. Yes, that takes some time. You've got to be licensed. But again, you know real estate. You might be able to do that. You could work for a property management company as a property manager. You could become a short sale expert. In some areas, we're probably going to see some short sales because people are indeed losing their jobs. And if you're a good writer, you could write articles or blogs for other realtors. And I've even gotten $200 per article for articles that I've written for other realtors. So there's plenty of ways to get side jobs to augment your income if you or your significant other loses their job, you can help augment it with some of your current talents. And one way you can do that is to go to this website on the right called SideHustleNation.com. You can list your job there, your availability. You can also find jobs that you might be able to do. Here's another place where you can find jobs. This is called Upwork. Dot com. People from all over the country and around the world provide their services from home on Upwork. I have been able to get articles written, books edited. Uh, it's amazing what you can get, and you can offer your services on Upwork. And so, and almost all of these folks work from home. So it's a great website, Upwork.com. If you don't have an emergency fund and you need money, consider cashing in unused credit um, gift cards, not credit cards, but unused gift cards. In 2019, last year, Americans bought about $171 billion worth of gift cards, but at any one time, 10 to 19% are sitting around in drawers, like what you see in these pictures, and 6% are never redeemed. The sad fact, if you look at some of these gift cards, like uh, Toys R Us on the bottom and in the drawer you see borders, guess what? Those companies are out of business. What do you think those cards are worth? Nothing. So if you've got some spare time, which we do right now sitting at home, go through your drawers and look for any unused gift cards and see if you can go online and redeem them. If you can't, there are other places where people will exchange gift cards, and you could redeem them for something else, and there are places where people will buy them. Just Google unused gift cards, and you'll find places where you can cash them in. Well, as you may know, uh, on March 26, just a couple of days ago, Congress reached a deal on a $20 trillion dollar stimulus package for this country. And thanks, thanks to the National Association of Realtors, we have gotten some major provisions for Realtors put in. All I can tell you is before NAR got involved, Realtors were not even considered, not even an afterthought. So NAR has done us a good service on this one. So here's what's happened. It includes $350 billion for what is called the SBA 7A loan program. So businesses with 500 employees or fewer can get loans up to $10 million. So if you're a team or if you're a small broker, you might be able to qualify for this loan program. And you can use this towards your mortgage interest, towards your rents, towards your utilities, and even payroll costs. And a portion of these loans will be forgivable. How much, I don't know. And please, do not count on not paying back these loans. The government has a pretty long memory when it comes to loans. They never forget. So don't count on any of it being forgivable. If it is, it's just a bonus. But that's one thing that NAR got included because that's rare for small businesses. And again, brokers and commission-based salespeople can be eligible for these benefits. 
So independent contractors can apply for unemployment benefits. This is the first time in history that this has ever happened. Previous to this date, independent contractors have never been able to apply for unemployment benefits. So thanks to NAR, we are able to do that. And so you'll be able to get $600 a week for four months on top of your own state benefit. Now, I know what you're asking, how do I apply? I have no idea. No one's quite sure yet, but if you go to nar.realtor forward slash coronavirus, we have the most current information there on the relief stimulus package, how to apply, and all of that there. And of course, every state will be different in their unemployment benefits. But again, this is a real benefit for us and a first time. The bill also includes one-time payments of $1,200 to most Americans. It's based on your income that you reported in 2018, and households can also receive an additional $500 per child but they've got to be under a certain age, and individuals who earn $99,000 or more will not be entitled to this. So if you're single when you filed in 2018, you will get no check. And if you're married couple, uh, married filing jointly, earning $198,000 or more, you will get no check as well. So just keep that in mind. And again, these keep changing minute by minute. So just check the NAR website for the most up-to-date information. I was changing this presentation up to about two hours before we started this program, and I'm sure it's changing even while we're talking. But I've done my best. So as you may know, on March 28th, Homeland Security included residential and commercial real estate as an essential service. So that's the good news. The bad news is your state, county, and city orders may be more restrictive. So for example, even though at the federal level, real estate is now classified as an essential service, which means in theory, we'll be able to go out and do real estate again in California and at our local county level, we are still restricted from leaving our homes because real estate is still not classified as an essential service uh, in our local area. So again, your local laws control, even though it's been opened up. So our county and our state are working to get real estate categorized as an essential service at our state and local level, and maybe sometime in the near future, we'll be able to resume our normal practices. But for the moment, we in California are pretty much restricted to our homes. And the other question is, will we still be entitled to those unemployment benefits because now we're an essential service that theoretically we should be able to go out and do business? Uh, I don't know. In theory, I guess we would, but again, stay in touch uh, with your local real estate board because they should have the most up-to-date local information. But you can see how confusing this has all become. So what else can you do? Well, the fastest way to increase your income is to get paid more for what you do. And here's a problem with that. What do clients think we do to earn our money? Guess what? When it comes to selling a house, all they think we do is put a sign on the lawn and the ad on the internet, and it magically sells and closes itself. Buyers believe that all we do is drive them around, show them a few properties, and it closes and we collect a big fat check. Well, is that at all true? Well, as you and I both know, that's not even close to what we do. So let me just suggest a few things. Here's what I do. 
I give every seller something I call my home seller's guide. This explains everything I do to get them the highest price in the shortest amount of time for their home. And so what I do is I give them a list of everything that I do to earn my money behind the scenes when I'm not in front of them. So for example, I go through this page. Here's 13 things that I do when I'm not working with you. And the next page, this is 28 things that I do. And it goes on and on and on until I get to the last two pages, which explains more of the things that I do and more of the things that I do. And why do I do this? Because I want them to understand that just like they work hard for their money, I work hard for my money. And just like I would never go to their place to ask for part of their paycheck, they should never come to me and ask for part of my commission. And as a result, I get paid more when I list a property than almost any other agent in my area. So I make more money, and that helps me to be able to service my clients better and to have a good emergency fund. When I work with buyers, I want them to know that it's not just showing them around and nothing. I explain to them that behind the scenes, when I'm not with them, I am doing inspections. I am doing the preliminary title report and making sure that they have all the inspections that they need to make sure that the property is sound. And again, it goes on and on and on for pages and pages, about seven, eight pages and 151 things I do to earn my money. And the reason I do this, because this is a totally different list than the one I have for sellers, is because I want them to sign a buyer broker agreement with me. Why should they pay me if they buy a property from anybody, whether it's a builder, a new home, they buy it from their Bob, friend Bob or their uncle Max, I want them to sign a buyer broker agreement with me so I'm guaranteed I get paid when I'm working with any buyer. So those have helped me out over the last 44 years to make sure that buyers pay me, sellers pay me, and a few other people pay me as well. So I put it all together in this thing I call my Defending Your Commission Manual. If you're interested in my lists and how I do this, you can get this, which is called my manual. It includes 151 things for sellers, 152 things for buyers, 102 things that help expired listings understand what we do to help to sell their house. I have things, 120 things that we as realtors can do that for sale by owners cannot. So you'll get paid more, get more listings, just really will help you. I normally sell that for $129.95. I sold tens of thousands of these all across the country. If you're interested, it's $99.95 to you. Just use the discount code SAVE30, and it includes not only electronically these guides, but it also includes a two-hour download of my presentation called Defending Your Commission. So if you're interested in that, just email me, michaelsoonlee at gmail.com. But if you do have an emergency fund, congratulations, you're well on your way to not only surviving, but thriving any slowdown that you might experience in your market. So you've got a unique opportunity with this emergency fund to maintain your marketing presence because most agents in your area are going to cut their advertising budgets to the bone. You won't hear from them for a long time. So if you do any marketing at all during this period, you're going to be have much higher visibility when we come out the other side. So stay in touch with your clients, please. Be a resource for them. Try and send 20 handwritten notes a day. Nobody does handwritten notes anymore. Everybody does email. Send handwritten notes. Nurture your existing clients because you want them to remember you after this is over. One of the things that I've done is I've sent all of my clients 
this email. And it just says, I want you to know I'm here to help. My heart goes out to our families with children in schools that are shut down, our seniors in assisted living, our neighbors at the hospitals, our local businesses, and anyone else impacted by this pandemic. I've been selling real estate for 44 years in the Bay Area. Due to the coronavirus, things are a bit slow in the real estate business. So if you need help with a trip to the grocery store, visiting the doctor, going to the bank, or even getting bills paid, I have time to help. If I'm not available, I have other people who can step in. You'll be surprised how many good people there are here in the Bay Area who are happy to help you. So feel free to call me if you need anything. My phone number is 925-864-8848. It does not need to be just about real estate. It can be a personal issue, and I'll see if I can help in some way. Stay safe. Michael. And I've gotten lots of great response from this, just letting them know that I'm here to help. So I hope you'll consider doing something similar. Stay in touch with your clients right now. Get your seller's properties ready to go on the market right now. If you can't go visit the property, at least begin planning your sales timeline. Every seller, I put together a seven-page timeline of what I'm going to do moment by moment to get their property ready to go on the market. So you can see this is one of my listings from last year. So I was getting estimates for getting the property fixed up, making a list of things they're going to consign or donate or haul. I'd send pictures of items for consignment. I helped them figure out how do they pack their clothes, get their household items ready. When do you move your major pieces of furniture to your new home? When do you consign everything. When do we stage? When do we take photos? Everything from A to Z. My clients really appreciate this. You don't have to necessarily get a property to do this, but it really does help. Don't forget education during this slow period. It's your chance to get a jump on your competition. So one of the things you'll want to do is go to this website, www.nar.realtor forward slash right hyphen tools hyphen right hyphen now. They've got lots of webinars you can take. It's just wonderful. And a few other things you might want to consider, get a class on Facebook Live and or Zoom. These are going to help you to stay in touch with your clients without having to be face to face. Now, if you're If you want to know when you can retire, you're probably wondering because your stock portfolio has probably gone down in value. You may have to work a little longer until it comes back. So just for example, if you want to have a $100,000 annual income, that's what you have today, when you retire, you might need a little less because you don't have all the expensive clothes, the cars, the software, all of that. You can use the multiply by 25 rule, which says... You take your $85,000 that you need in retirement, minus your Social Security, that's 63.4 that you'll need after Social Security. Multiply that by 25, you need about a million 585 in total assets if you want to be able to retire comfortably. Now, how do you know how much Social Security you're going to be getting exactly? All you have to do is go to the Social Security website, sign in at www.ssa.gov, and they'll tell you exactly how much you'll get at any point in time when you retire. Well, the average American only has $96,000 saved for retirement. That's not enough. And 40% of boomers have nothing saved for retirement, and we're just about ready to retire. So get with a financial planner soon, please. The average cost to live where we are is about $5,000 a month, which will last you 21.5 months if you get 6% return. And if you get $1,800 additional in Social Security, that would last you 36 months in San Francisco. After three years, what are you going to do? You don't want to be homeless, especially in the Bay Area. Whew, that's bad. So save now for retirement. Part of your retirement budget should be vacations. 
you need time off. This is my wife and I. We love cruising. We did five cruises last year. <laughs> they just canceled our cruise to the Middle East next month. Uh, it's going to be a while before we're cruising again. But you can do it without losing any business by having a good, solid team behind you. When I was gone for five times last year, my clients knew I was gone, but we didn't skip a beat. I had one of my best years last year. So trust your fellow realtors. But if you can't afford a cruise, you can do something different. You can do something called a staycation. What is that? Figure out what you want to do and stay locally. Create a staycation budget, just like everything else. You can rent a place, house sit, camp, or you could stay at home. Look for discounts on the web. There's plenty of those out there, and they're going to be even more after the quarantine is over. You can be a tourist in your own city. You may not have visited a lot of wonderful places that you only show your visitors. So enjoy your staycation if that fits into your budget. So a couple of smart money moves. Have some cash on hand. Please have cash on hand in case you get quarantined. Keep an emergency fund and keep it big if you can. Make sure you have proper insurance, errors and emissions, life insurance, health insurance, car insurance, home insurance. Keep good records. Open a safe deposit box at a bank. Take advantage of direct deposit, automatic bill pay, and please avoid selling depressed stocks as much as possible. I know that's a temptation, but any financial planner will tell you that if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average over the last 100 years, we've had peaks and we have valleys. If you look at 1933 after the stock market crash, you see things went up. They dropped a bit in 1950, they went up. In 82, during Black Monday, they went down, they went back up. During the 2008 crash, they went down, they went back up, and they're down again. So frankly, I'm buying lots of stock right now, but if you, if you sell your stock right now at a low cost, what you're doing is you're locking in your losses. So diversify your investments. Do have some real estate, but have stocks, have bonds, have commodities, have other things. Do not put all of your eggs in one basket. So what does my crystal ball say? And again, this is strictly my predictions based on 44 years of real estate. Hopefully it'll stimulate some creative thinking on your part. Well, I think in some areas, the real estate market is going to slow down. How long it's going to slow down is anyone's guess, but only the strong will survive. So if you don't have an emergency fund, cut expenses now. If you do, try and keep that emergency fund as filled as possible. Many people are going to consider telecommuting, so buyers are going to consider more suburbs than urban areas, so they're going to become more popular. I think I buyers are going to become more prevalent if they can find the funds to do it, because buyers aren't going to want to be subject to uncertainty, is my house going to sell or not? I think sellers going to expect their homes to return to pre-crisis values. You know how unrealistic they can be. So I think you're going to see some price reductions in many areas. And so you're going to be, have to be an expert at negotiating and getting sellers to be more realistic. You'll need to be aware of local market movements and sales trends. Know the trends in your local list prices, price reductions, closing, Subscribe to a service that reports local and hyper-local data. You can see down below here, these are cities in my local area last month and what's been going on. And work with your local Realtor network to get information on what's going on with local sales and attend your local marketing meetings. Include both crisis and pre-crisis comps in your CMAs. Educate your clients to expect post- and pre-crisis values to be different. Are your prices rising or falling in your area? And you'll know that by using list price versus sales price comps. 
expect low appraisals because fluctuating prices are going to cause appraised value to be under the offer price in many instances. So you need to be an expert at appraisal appeals. Listing agents could ask the seller to lower the price or make concessions, and buyers could offer to increase their price to some specific amount or split it with the seller, but you might want to put that in your offers from now on. So you're going to have to go the extra mile. Virtual tours are going to be an absolute essential for listings. So, but show your face in them. Show your personality. Have fun with your virtual tours because you're not going to be able to see a lot of clients face to face. Virtual showings are going to be much more popular. This will at least help to narrow down the search for your buyers before they actually want to see the properties. And of course, the listing agents are going to have to understand this. And you might need some new sign writers, like ones that said, if you want a private showing, please contact this number. So first thing I would do is to ask callers if they have an agent. If they do, tell their agent to show the property. If they don't have an agent, verify that they've been pre-approved. If not, send them to a reciprocal lender. Now for me, I make sure that any lender I work with gives me business before I refer them business. That's what I call a reciprocal lender. That's my requirement for working with lenders. Up to you if that's what you want to do. But then once you send them to a lender and they're pre-approved, show them the property within the bounds of safety. And again, you need to be ready to survive a slower market. So again, cut as much discretionary spending as you can right now Find additional sources of income if you need to. Maintain your marketing presence in your area because when you come out the other side, you're going to be very, very well known. Be a calming influence for your clients. Listen, listen, listen to them because being calm leads to confidence, leads to more clients. We will get through this. Just remind them of that. And take care of yourself. Exercise, do affirmations, meditate. Be grateful for what you have in your health and give back. Train your brain for success right now. Focus on your business and please maintain your sense of humor. Here's a couple of headlines I've seen recently. I thought these were kind of amusing. The day sale surge as Americans hoard toilet paper. Might be a good time to invest in Kohler or somebody else who makes bidets. Some people aren't shaking hands because of the coronavirus. I'm not shaking hands because everyone is out of toilet paper. <laughs> and this one I thought was kind of interesting. A disturbing number of people think coronavirus is related to Corona beer. That's a little scary. So. <laughs> So what I've tried to do is provide you with the latest information on how I believe the coronavirus will impact our profession and our clients. I hope you'll consider implementing some of the financial advice I've provided. These are trying times, but again, we will get through this. I wish you the best of luck in the future and hope to meet you in person someday. Just remember to always keep your clients' interests first, and you can never go wrong. Please feel free to email me if I can support you in some way. Now, I believe we have a few questions that have been sent in. Brittany, what have you got for us? Hi, Michael. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for that informative presentation. Um, this my was pleasure. great. <laughs> really appreciate it. So now at this time, we do have some questions in our queue. So for our members who are listening in, it's not too late to submit a question. You can simply send a message in the chat or email us at financialwellness at nar.realtor. So Michael, here's our first question. Um, can you provide some tips on ways you are doing virtual tours or some great tools to help get started? Well, within the bounds of your local restrictions, you know, what I do is I do a Facebook Live broadcast to my Facebook fans. And I've got, I think, 7,000 Facebook fans. And so oh, wow. I do a Facebook Live tour, show my 
face first, to have a little fun, tell them all the fun things about the property, and then walk them through the property. Only takes about two or three minutes. I plan it out in advance. I make sure the lighting is good in advance. And then I record it so that I could send it to any buyer who's interested in the property. They can then see the flow of the property. They can see all the rooms. They can see the backyard, the front yard, the street, and those kinds mm -hmm. of things. That's the easiest way I've found to do virtual tours because I get two for the price of one. I do a Facebook Live, and then I've got a recording, which then becomes a virtual tour. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. That's a great tip. You're um, welcome. So is there also a way that um, maybe we can include your home seller's guideline, um, make it available for, you know, listeners who are tuning in to today's call, or should they email you? Um, what no, would best you thing to do is best thing to do is email me, and I can explain exactly how it works, how I use it. But the buyer's guide just walks them through everything from, you know, because buyers have not a clue. How do you go from looking at a house to owning it? So I go mm -hmm. through step by step how to do it, all the people that are involved. And what I'm doing though, Brittany, is I'm building my value. I'm helping them to understand that this is a very complex thing that we do behind the scenes. It's not, a mm -hmm. lot of young people think I can just buy a home online. Well, guess what? It's a way more complicated than that. So that's <laughs> what my guide does. So just email me, Michael Soon Lee at Gmail, and I'll be happy to explain it all. Okay, great. And then maybe also in addition to that, um, could you share some tips on how you also got your followings up on social? Um, you know, people are very impressed with the fact that you've gotten over 700 followers. That's impressive. Any tips yeah, it's for actually, to share? Yeah, it's actually 7,000 followers. Oh, 7,000, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's just being involved with my community. And the thing you want to do is to be a hero mm -hmm. to your fans, H-E-R-O. H stands for helpful. So what I do is, you know, it, I let them know, for example, you know, what's going on with real estate right now. I can't show property, so I let them know I've got virtual tours you can look at, these kinds of things. Um, e you want to be in, you know, have everything out there. So you want to be everywhere. You want to let them know that you're at this, doing this, you're doing this for them, you're being out there. You want to be a resource. If you need people to cut your lawn, if you need someone to help you fix a refrigerator during this virus, if you have a water heater that's not working, I'm a resource for you. And then, oh, just to be outstanding. Just let them know that you're there and you're caring. Be a hero, mm -hmm. but don't market all the time. Just be there for them and be part of the community. You're not there to sell, you're there to be a friend. And for me, it's worked very, very well. That's awesome. Oh, that's so great, Michael. We do have a couple Thank more you. questions. Um, okay. So, Someone wants to know if they, and, and this is kind of a more, look at it from this perspective or stance of what would you do? Um, they mm -hmm. think that it might be a good idea to stop paying the extra principal pay, payments amounts on their mortgage to save that extra cash in case they may need it for regular future payments. Do you think that this is a good idea or what would you do in that scenario? Well, it depends. Again, if you do not have an emergency emergency fund, that is certainly one thing you can do. Because beginning mm -hmm. on March 13th, a borrower who has a federally backed loan, in other words, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, can request forbearance of their loan payments up to 180 days. But you do that through your loan servicer. But okay. I mean, personally, what would I do? If I could afford to pay it, I pay it. I try not to add to my debt load because I'm always remembering I'm going to have to pay that back at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that makes me very uneasy, Brittany. 
I pay every credit card bill every single month. I have a zero balance every month. I hate to owe anything to anybody. And maybe that's part of my upbringing. My parents owned their house free and clear, their car free and clear. They didn't owe anything to anybody. Uh, and I kind of follow that principle as well. But as a last resort, it's something you may want to consider. But I would recommend talking to a financial planner about this. Because they can okay. look at your overall picture. Don't just look at this payment, that payment, and this payment. You want somebody who can look at the big picture and help you strategize about your own financial situation. That's a good point. Yeah, definitely. Um, quick question for you in regards to the different um, sites that you mentioned earlier in regards to your FICO score. Do you know, mm -hmm. for example, and, and then if you don't have the correct answer or not, if my FICO doctor Com took the place of TransUnion for the free credit it report? It did. Oh, That's the okay. latest. Okay. Yeah. okay. TransUnion is, <laughs> is no more. <laughs> oh, wow. That's surprising. And then um, you mentioned earlier also in your slides that the $12,000 um, being returned if you're filing single, that is based off of, and confirm or deny, but that is based off of if you've already filed your 2019 taxes or 2018. So, if so you it's 12, yeah, it's 1,200, Brittany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I it were 12,000, but it, no, it's okay. It's 12, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to shock people or have them be too optimistic. It's $1,200 <laughs> and it's based on your 2008 filed tax return. So if you didn't file yet for 2000, I'm sorry, 2018 tax return, if, if you haven't filed your 2018, I don't know what they're going to do. So I think you're out of luck. So <laughs> quickly file your 2018, do your 2019 to know if you're going to owe or if you're going to get a refund. Mm -hmm. But and again, then the law is still in flux. 2019 then they'll base it off of your 2019 tax return, I correct? No, I don't know. Okay. The law currently says 2018 tax return. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a member that asked that, so I can follow up with them and confirm sure. on that decision. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, can you sure. recommend a good lender for a HELOC loan or how much cash <laughs> maybe you could have on hand? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not in the business of recommending lenders or title companies or anything yeah. else. Check in your local area and check with other realtors because costs of HELOCs can vary widely. So what you want to mm -hmm. look at is not just the rate on the HELOC. Don't just go for the lowest rate because then they may char be charging the highest cost. So I oh. like to work with a local mortgage broker. But again, mm -hmm. a lot of banks and lenders can provide fairly low HELOCs as well. First place you always look is with your current home lender. Right, okay. But then you okay. can always shop. There's nothing illegal or wrong about shopping. Shop with, I like to work with a mortgage broker who can shop across a large group of people who can get me the best deal on a HELOC. Okay, that's a good idea. And something that I do want to add in, since I had a couple members um, ask this question, just note that the recording for today's session is going to be available tomorrow. Visit nar.realtor forward slash CSFW forward slash webinars. Okay, I do have a couple more questions for you, Michael. Sure. Um, does the forbearance go to the end of the loan, or is it just four months later? Well, I'm not quite sure at the moment. Um, what mm -hmm. the law says is a borrower with a federally backed loan can request a forbearance for a period of up to 180 days through their loan servicer. So it's not automatic, number one. You have to mm -hmm. request it, number two. And it doesn't mm -hmm. really say at the moment whether it's tacked on, um, whether it doubles your payments. Before I ever did that, I would look into the law very, very carefully because you could find right. yourself in some big trouble down the road because 
you know, there's always a price to pay, Brittany. Uh, and, and, you know, the lenders are going to be hurting, so I'm not sure exactly how they're going to do it. But as time goes on, I'm sure NAR is going to provide some more detail on all of these. But, you know, NAR is such a great resource. Yeah. Okay. So that's great that they can – and to your point, everything is changing, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Minute by minute. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I have another question. Do you have any advice um, for maybe property managers or leasing agents that you could provide maybe during this time to help them, um, you know, maybe setting up an emergency savings um, funds, anything for specifically property managers and leasing agents? Well, if you're a property manager or leasing agent, I mean, there are some things that are available. So just let your multi-family property owners know that they can get uh, an extension on their payments as well. So they have to document their financial hardship though. Uh, if you're okay. a single family homeowner, you can just request it and say it's because of the coronavirus. Uh, if you're a multi-family building owner, uh, you've got to be able to show that your tenants are not paying rent. And you can request a forbearance of up to 30 days, and then that can be extended for two additional 30-day periods. So it can be extended up to 90 days, but you've got to request it every 30 days. So just right. let your owners know that it is possible, but, you know, you've got to request it and you've got to prove that, you know, you're not getting your rent. Okay. So, again, okay. property managers need to be aware of this new law. And, again, NAR is going to be providing additional resources for all of us, including property managers. Right. Okay. And last, to not least, last question. Um, I'm not sure if you would know, but do you know of any limitations about the unemployment benefits that were just recently passed by chance? Well, my guess is that you're going to have to, number one, follow your local unemployment, um, you know, restrictions. Because right. whatever benefits they have, they're, everybody's going to default to your local. So right. if you go to your local unemployment office website, you'll see exactly how do you qualify. Mm -hmm. Ex with the exception, because it'll always say independent contractors are not entitled to unemployment benefits. Well, that's been waived during the coronavirus issue. And mm -hmm. so they're going to rule exactly how you qualify. And so all this does is it adds on to the benefits that you will get at the local level. Mm -hmm. And again, this is all in flux. We're all trying to figure it out. So right. <laughs> just stay in touch with NAR <laughs> and stay flexible. That's true. And so members can actually just visit nar.realtor uh, forward slash coronavirus, and it has all of the updates on there. And then, so I also just got um, some confirmation that if you've already filed your 2019 taxes, that that stimulus package would be based off of the 2019 filing. Oh, so very good. Thank good you to for, know. for coming up. Yeah, thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Um, so, Michael, um, closing statement if you could leave us with one more key point, what would that one takeaway be, please? Well, I would number one say, Brittany, stay flexible, stay light on your feet because things are going to change at a mile a minute. But then keep your clients in mind because they're going through the same thing that we are possibly worse. So if you can be a calming influence, a source of information to them, they're going to be relying on you when we come out of this because you're going to need your clients when we come out of this and they're going to need you as well. So if you always keep, you know, what's best for my clients in mind, you're going to be in great shape. But stay flexible 
and stay on top. This is our responsibility as professional realtors to know what's going on in our business. You've got to be aware of it before your clients do. So <laughs> keep reading, keep talking to people, stay light on your feet. That's perfect. Love that closing. Thank you so much, Michael. So one thing that my, I would like to ask pleasure. our listeners, you can also find additional resources and a free budget spreadsheet uh, for your personal and business by visiting financialwellness.realtor. This center will provide you with tools, calculators, and a robust financial library that's specifically geared for you. Okay. Great news, I just wanna point out for our members, the National Association of Realtors has brought back the Right Tools Right Now program. This relaunch program includes reduced to no cost resources to support you through this COVID-19 pandemic. So the site includes webinars, educational resources, and a free copy of NAR's Profile Home Buyers and Sellers Guide. So visit nar.realtor forward slash right tools right now. All right, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This concludes our webinar. Special thanks to our members for joining the call, and special thanks to Michael. Thank you so much for leading it today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Brittany. Also, thank you. You were great. And so for members who are listening, if you've missed any part of this webinar session, we will be posting the recorded webinar and PowerPoint under nar.realtor forward slash CSSW forward slash webinar. I repeat, the recording will be available for your review on Tuesday, March 31st at nar.realtor forward slash CSSW forward slash webinars. All right, and so at the end of this session, a survey bar is gonna pop up on your desktop browser. Please leave us your feedback on today's presentation. Um, thank you so much, and we look forward to having you join us for our next Financial Source webinar. It's going to be on Tuesday, April 2nd at 1 p.m. Central. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Michael. Uh, we really appreciate you leading this webinar today. Thanks, Brittany. Have a good one, everyone. Be safe.